Okay, uh, so I'm happy to introduce uh, Avelo Sepulveda, uh, who will be talking about uh, the scaling limit of a uh, discrete uh, Coulomb gas. Thank you very much, uh, Nina, for the, and Gina and Yuen for the invitation and for the organization of this seminar. Uh, well, first, uh, I would like to say that my thoughts are with the people in Ukraine that are suffering now. I don't know if there is much we can do, but at least uh, we, I hope that the war stops, uh, any war stops. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to discuss about discrete Coulomb gas. So this is a joint work in progress with Christoph Gaban. In fact, most of it we are, we are uh, writing now. So it should be out soon, I hope. Uh, and this talk, so when I planified this talk, I, it, it is, uh, I did it in a weird way. So it is uh, it's a little bit more like a paper. So first I will, I will describe what a discrete Coulomb gas is. And if, in fact, immediately I will tell you everything or almost everything I want to uh, say as a result of the talk. So it will, I will start with the results and then I will justify the context. And, in, uh, and, and the idea of this talk is that and, and of this work with Christoph is that we are reproving many things that were already known. So not all of the, most of the results I'm going to tell you, they are not, uh, they are not new, but the proofs are new. And in fact, the proofs are going to be based in, in two main ideas. So, so the scaling limit itself, it is, it is new, but the rest is, it will not be. So the two main ideas will be the relationship between the Coulomb gas with two interesting objects. The first one is the integrated value Gaussian profil, and the second one is the Villain model. And if I have some time, I will discuss about some uh, recent progress. Uh, we, are, we are working on, on the geometry of Coulomb gases, but this I don't, I don't promise I will be able to say much. Uh, so just let me discuss what a Coulomb gas is. Uh, so imagine you start with a, a graph. Yes, and uh, a Coulomb gas, what will be? It will, we will associate to each point of the graph a certain charge, either a positive or negative. But the, the interesting thing is it's going to be an integral charge. So I'm putting either protons or electrons everywhere. So here I can have plus 10, minus 10, or minus 100, whatever. And just uh, for the sake of, uh, of completeness, I'm going to put one point to be zero. Yes, and this will be due to the fact that I want uh, the Laplacian is invisible. So I'm going to work with the uh, zero Laplacian. And well, what is going to be the probability of a given configuration? It will be proportional to uh, the electrostatic energy, which is uh, this term over here. This term over here, which is the sum and, and the one over two, or which I, I like to write something just like an inner product. No? So it is will be one half, Q minus Laplacian to the minus one of Q. Uh, so this, in physics, it represents uh, just a Coulomb gas. So you have a, a, a gas of charged particles that they can take well, that we have discretized, and and we can put how many particles we want in each in each point, and we ask ourselves, well, what is the probability of seeing this object? And uh, the main question, so. So what is the idea? The idea is to describe this Coulomb gas with regards to the inverse temperature. So what happens at high temperature, say beta smaller than one, and what happens at a low temperature, which is beta bigger than one, and essentially what happens all the way through. Uh, so as I promised, I will start telling you the results. And I, I will start with the potential. So what happens at really, a high temperature. Well, one can look at the potential generated by these charges, and what will and uh, what they look like. They will look like so. This is for dimension bigger than two. Uh, it will look like the just the potential of it. it would, sorry, it will just look as a Gaussian free field. So we'll have the two point correlation function look like that of the Gaussian free field. And of course, due to the fact that I'm in take value, it will not be exactly that of a Gaussian prefield, but I will have an exponential, an exponentially decreasing uh, error. And furthermore, 
uh, imagine that you have a domain, let's say with zero boundary condition. Uh, let's say I'm zero outside. And now I discretize this domain. And I take a Coulomb gas here. Yes, so I'm making the discretization better and better. Well, uh, a Coulomb, the potential of a Coulomb gas here will converge to a continuum Gaussian free field on this domain with zero boundary condition, of course. So, so in a way, what we see is at a high temperature, the Laplacian to the minus one of the Gaussian of a Coulomb gas will converge to a Gaussian free field, but there is something important that I have to stress here. It is, it is the same inverse temperature. So at the same inverse temperature. Okay. So then one can say, okay, we understand how the, the potential of the Coulomb gas, gas behaves. How does uh, the Coulomb gas itself behaves? And here, again, uh, let me uh, draw my, uh, let, let's put it more so. So I draw my graph and I ask myself, okay, I want to look at the two point correlation function of this model. So I have a point here, I have a point here. What is the correlation function? Well, at high temperature, there is a, there is a process a physics process called device, device screening. And what does this physics process says? It tells you that in a way, whatever the Coulomb gas is looking at the green part, will, whatever the Coulomb gas is doing in the green part will be blocked quite quickly by the charge surrounding it. So that at the blue point, in fact, I'm not feeling anything. And the way, okay, this is the physics process, but how do we do it in math? So one thing to look at would be, okay, I will just look at the two point correlation function and we'll say that this point, two point correlation function is decreasing exponentially. Okay, so that's one option, which is what I've written here. There is another way to say, or, or I mean, there is another way to interpret this in, in, in a math point of view, which is stronger, which I will say, okay, I have the green part and I have the violet part. They have a, they are coupled, they have a joint law. And what we claim is that well, the, this, uh, the distance in total variation between the law of the, of the joint law of the green times this uh, pink, I, this is to the fact where they are both independent. Yes, uh, this is exponentially small. So this is much stronger than just the two-point correlation function. There is a, they are really close to being independent. Doesn't matter what I am doing in the green part. Somehow my system arranged itself to block it. So this is a second way of understanding device screening. There is a third way of understanding it, and it's saying the following: uh, Imagine imagine that I have my graph here. And I decided, or say maybe the fact that this, uh, this decorrelation is because I am somehow adding integral charges. So I, I will now try to add a charge uh, here, a charge alpha, and let's say here a charge minus alpha. So in fact, it, it is between zero and, and a point B, but this is the idea. So if alpha is an integral value charge, I am doing nothing because I can always, uh, the, the system can always put minus the charge on that point and just make it disappear. However, if alpha is not an, a natural number, uh, one can imagine that there is something uh, funny going on here. And the question is, well, as, as a probabilist, I would say, okay, are these two models absolutely continuous? Of course, they cannot be absolutely continuous in the red point, but are they absolutely continuous elsewhere? Yes, and one way to quantify this idea would be to say, okay, let's look at the partition function of the Coulomb with this alpha charge here, alpha minus alpha to the one with the Coulomb without uh, this irrational charge. So what can see is that this, as the graph converges uh, to the whole C2, this will converge to a constant. 
And this constant remains between zero and infinity. It doesn't matter how far away I put both points. So in a way, the system is, let's say, informally absolutely continuous with respect to the others. The system with a charge alpha, irrational charge, is uh, absolutely continuous with the system without this uh, irrational charge alpha, independently of how far away they are discharges. And what this explains is that it doesn't matter what's going on here. Somehow, the neighbors, they decide to, uh, they, they arrange itself. So somehow, uh, they hide this charge I added. This is the way that physicists understand it. And I, I cannot only hide integer value charges, I can also hide non-integer value charges. Okay. So I think that that is quite a lot to understand about the high temperature regime. So we do have the Laplacian to the minus one, it looks like a Gaussian, the potential looks like the Gaussian field at the same temperature. And uh, at, uh, at uh, the, the, the charges itself, they are quite independent from one point to another. They have this device screen property. What happens at low temperature? So at low temperature, Florif and Spencer proved that device screening cannot be true. And, uh, and they prove it in a quite convoluted way in my point of view. They say, okay, if device screening holds, there is an observable that should be holomorphic, but they can prove that this, this, this observable is not holomorphic. So, so things fall out. So they, they do not prove that the two-point correlation function is polynomial. They just say, okay, this, is, this cannot happen. Uh, and then one can, well, what happens with the potential? Uh, so Froelich and Spencer, so this is, so I will mark this paper. I will talk about this paper the whole time because it's a really important paper where they prove many of the things uh, that they are tangential to many of the things I want to discuss and, and sometimes not only tangential, but they, they actually touch it. But they, here they prove, yes, uh, is that the two point correlation function of the potential of the Coulomb gas is bounded by this quantity this quantity, uh, and in the case where beta uh, uh, of the highest temperature, this epsilon beta is equal to one. This is what we proved with Christoph. However, what Flick and Spencer proved, or it goes directly from the proofs, is that uh, when beta is going to infinity, so really I am colder, this epsilon beta is going to zero. So the, in a way, there is a phase transition in this epsilon beta in where it is equal to one for a long time, and then it goes to zero. And what we proved with Christoph in, in, a, in a paper the, of last year, it was in fact a, that this ratio, it is lower bounded by a constant depending on, on beta. And, and we expect this lower bound to be quite sharp as it is the one that it is uh, conjecturing in the physics literature. So in a way, this Laplacian, this potential of the Coulomb, it looks like a Gaussian free field for any temperature. However, what happens is that this, let's say, effective temperature, the effective, it is equal to beta uh, at uh, high temperature, and it is, and it is colder uh, than beta. Uh, no, not bigger or equal, strictly bigger at uh, low temperature. In fact, furthermore, we are quite close to proof, but it depends. It is conditional in recent results of uh, uh, Roland Bauer Smith, Yvonne Park, and Pierre Francois Rodriguez. The fact that this Laplacian to the minus one, so the potential of Q, the potential of the Coulomb gas, it is in fact converging at low temperature to a Gaussian free field, as in the case before. So when you discretize the space, so it is, uh, it, so this is not proven yet because we are missing a certain result that I will tell you in, in the talk, but there the, are the strong hints that in fact, the potential of a Coulomb gas, it always fits like a Gaussian free field, but what is different is this uh, effective temperature. Okay. So, so I discussed quite a long time about the Coulomb gas. And in a way, I feel that at least at high temperature and at low temperature, I could uh, explain macroscopically quite well what is going on uh, with, the, with the Coulomb gas. Uh, and 
one could say that the Coulomb gas is interesting in itself and, and it is true, it is uh, interesting in physics and, and it is a nice object. However, it is also related to many other stories. And this is a little bit what I want to tell. And also these other stories where it's related, they will aid us to prove everything I have stated. So let me go quickly through the context. So uh, the Coulomb gas appears in the context of, context of spin systems. And here I'm going to discuss a little bit about spin systems whose energy is given by the Dirichlet energy. Uh, so by spin system, I mean that I take a graph and for each vertex of the graph, I will associate uh, a spin, which, which will live in a group. So it is either the minus one, one for the Ising model, the XY model has uh, S1 as the, as the group, the Gaussian free field has uh, the real numbers of the group and the integer value of Gaussian free field will have the integer numbers of the group. And what is the probability measure associated to each object? Well, it will be a Gibbs measure whose energy is given by, uh, as I said, the Dirichlet energy. Uh, and uh, the base measure out of this is, is it is the um, hard measure of the group. Okay, so the main question here, it is how, how the system change in a qualitative sense when I change the inverse temperature. Uh, so let's study the easier, the easiest case, which is the Gaussian free field. The Gaussian free field, well, it is, uh, as, as the name says, it's Gaussian. So in fact, we can understand quite well its behavior with the temperature. And because it is Gaussian, a change in temperature just means changing, uh, change, multiplying the field by a certain constant. For me, these in qualitative behaviors, it looks essentially the same. I'm seeing the same thing that just with a different scale change, but there is nothing in a way deep that changed. But an, uh, so another important object related to the Gaussian free field would be its Laplacian. So the Laplacian to the Gaussian free field is also, one can compute what it is law, and it also follows a Gibbs measure. But now the measure, the energy which is associated is not the same measure as that of the Gaussian free field, but it's in fact, I, I like to write this like C minus Laplacian to the minus one psi, just the inner product is just the same as that of a Coulomb gas. A Coulomb gas. Which explains why the Gaussian free field will be hidden behind everything we are going to do with the Coulomb gas. In a way, the Laplacian of a Gaussian free field behaves like a, like a Coulomb gas, which is not constrained to be on the integer values. And for example, this allows us to approve directly, let's say device screening for the Gaussian free field. For the Gaussian free field device screening tells you the following. So if two points are a distance two or more in the graph, then the correlation is zero, which implies that everything that has a distance two or more, if I have two sets that are a distance two or more, in fact, they are independent. Yes. So device screening is quite strength, is strong in this world of the Gaussian free field. If I have two objects, which are distance two or two, two subset of the vertices that are distance two or more, what's going on in one set of vertices, vertices is completely independent to what's going on on the other set of vertices, which is not directly obvious from looking at the energy itself. Okay, so just so we agree on uh, what we are understanding by um, phase transition or what we're understanding by different behaviors Corresponding to beta, let's quickly look at what's going on with the ASIC model. In the ASIC model, when we are at really low temperature, uh, what the model wants to do is to pick a color. So here a color may be either plus one or minus one. So ASIC model is the one where the spins are either plus or minus one. Yes. And here I'm the, the, the field itself pick a color. How can we see this uh, from the point of view of computations? We could, for example, look at the two point correlation function, sigma at the point V1 times sigma at the point V2. And this will be always positive for all V1 
can be true, let's say in the whole graph. So everywhere I am looking, it doesn't matter how far apart they are, in a way they feel the influence of each other. If one pick to be blue, the other one would want to pick to be blue. Uh, however, this, this is not the case at low temperature, uh, sorry, at high temperature. So when the temperature is high, everyone is so happy, everyone is going so fast that in fact they forget what their neighbor is doing. And we can look at this also in the two point correlation function, for example, and this will be uh, exponentially small. So it will be like exponential of minus V1 plus V2 times a constant. So at high temperature, everyone forgets their neighbors. And in fact, one can do more. One could say, for example, that whatever is going on here in the green part, it is independent of whatever is going to in this, uh, well, it doesn't, in this uh, pink part. They are, they can be coupled. I mean, the, the total variation of the of the couple of these two paths with an independent, uh, with, with a with a couple where both of them are independent. This the total variation distance is exponentially small in that distance. So it's, so things are really quite correlated. And what happens at beta critical? is that in fact, you forget about your friends, what your friends are doing, but you don't forget that quickly. So you get this exponential of sigma V1 times sigma V2. This behaves like one over V1 minus V2 to a certain power alpha, okay? So what we are going to see throughout the rest of the talk is we are going to try to understand these uh, phase transitions. When do they occur? At which level they occur? And in, and about the models we discussed before, when they occur, and the most important thing of all is how does this affect the Coulomb gas? So we are going to uh, prove now some of the statements I gave in the introduction regarding uh, the Coulomb gas, but by using its relationship to the integer value Gaussian free field. So just to recall, the integer value Gaussian free field is the spin system uh, whose uh, associated to the Dirichlet energy, whose group is just the integers. Yes. So it just feels like a Gaussian free field condition to have values on the integers. Uh, and this important paper of Lorca and Spencer that I mentioned reappears here. There's the following. So if you take a Gaussian free field on a graph at inverse temperature beta minus one, and here I want to, we have this not inverse temperature beta, but beta minus one, which will appear we will see later why, why it matters. And we put it with zero boundary condition, let's say. So what, what happens if the temperature is really low, the temperature is really low, it really it is really expensive to make one jump, yes? And one can prove using a pair type argument that in fact, the two point correlation function, it will decrease exponentially fast. In fact, the one point correlation function it, it does not explode. Uh, and and this, this is somehow easy. And this is, uh, of course, for D bigger or equal than two. This, is, this does not call for D equal one. Um, however, for D equal two, what Frederick and Spencer proved is that the two point correlation function behaves like that of a Gaussian uh, free field with a small correction. This epsilon is the same epsilon we had for the Coulomb gas, so almost the same. So there, there is a correction for the two-point correlation function. And it really, okay. And, but apart from that correction, it really behaves like that of a Gaussian free field. And that of a Gaussian free field is, uh, of course, this uh, one over, uh, okay. so it behaves like the log of the uh, distance between them. Okay. So this is, is, this is really the hard part of the story. There is a, a recent, there are some recent new proof about this, but even though they are new and everything, they cannot, they do not get uh, this correction path. I mean, they do not get it perfectly, but at least they have that this goes to infinity as beta goes to infinity. They do not have this in the recent proofs. Okay. And then one asks himself, okay, this, this looks like a nice 80s theory. What does it have to do with the Coulomb gas? Uh, and in fact, there is a formula which is called modular invariance formula, which has to do with the uh, Riemann theta function. 
uh, with certain properties of the Riemann theta function. But in our context, it can be interpreted in the following way. Imagine that you want to compute the Laplace transform of a, a, of a Coulomb gas, of the potential of a Coulomb gas in this case. Okay? As, as we saw before, this, this should look quite similar to that of a Gaussian free field. Yes, because the Laplacian of a Gaussian free field looks similar to the Laplacian of, uh, oh, oh, sorry, the Laplacian of the Gaussian free field looks really similar to that of a Coulomb gas. To, to a Coulomb gas. However, so, however, they, can, they cannot be the same. I mean, there are some condition. The modular invariance formula gives us exactly what is the correction term. And the correction term is related to an integrated value Gaussian free field. And what I want to stress here the most, so it is, so before it was the Laplace transform, now it's the Fourier transform. But what is the most interesting here is, in, is that there is this change of temperature. So the proof of this modular invariance formula is just a certain intelligent way of uh, using a Fourier, a Fourier transform. So this is essentially what is behind. And this is why there is a change in, in temperature. Okay, and what are certain consequences of this formula? So let us see, for example, uh, one can say something about the two point correlation function of the potential of the Coulomb gas. So it will be, as I said before, it will be that of a Gaussian free field with a small correction. And the small correction is given by this integrated value Gaussian free field at, a, at inverse temperature, which is changed. Uh, but also, I mean, given that one can do this for any f, one can also say what is the two-point correlation function of the Coulomb gas, and it will give you, and as before, it will be given by the two-point correlation function of the Laplacian of the Gaussian free field and the two-point correlation function of the Laplacian of this integrated value Gaussian free field at a different temperature. And with this, I can start proving uh, the statements I said before. For example, if one wants to study the two-point correlation function of the Coulomb gas at high temperature, well, uh, they are exactly the, the what's going on with the Gaussian free field with the correction term given by the integral value Gaussian free field. But because we are at really a low temperature for the Gaussian free field, well, we know that for low temperature for the Gaussian free field, this behaves exponentially small, yes? And here, out of this proof, a little bit of work of this proof is to show the scaling limit of the potential of the Coulomb gas, yes? So we had, so we had that the equality is not always for the two-point correlation function. It was also true for the Laplace transform. Uh, so if we take a, just a quick note for those, uh, okay. So if, if we, you, could, you could take, you could test this integrated value Gaussian free field against a smooth function and you divide by the size of the graph, let's say from the bigger or equal than two. So this one will converge weakly or in probability to zero as the graph, as a lambda converges to, uh, to your continuous domain. So what you do is that you just look at the formula you have a certain Fourier transform. This Fourier transform will go to uh, one. So you have convergence of the Laplace transform of the Laplace transform of a Coulomb gas of the potential of a Coulomb gas to uh, that of a Gaussian free field. So this gives the the, the the finite dimensional convergence and the tightness is, is almost all free also from the formula. So with this we see that at low at really High temperature, the Gaussian, the, the potential of a Coulomb gas is exactly or behaves almost exactly the same as, as a Gaussian free field. What happens at high temperature? Well, at high temperature, we have the same formula. This formula does not depend on the temperature. However, the two point correlation function of the uh, integrated value Gaussian free field is not anymore exponentially decreasing, it behaves like a green function with this correction, which is the epsilon beta correction. Yes. So here you get at the end epsilon beta divided by beta, the green function of V1 and V2. So, so now what we see 
is that we have a, a, we obtain the uh, an upper bound of the two point correlation function. We know it cannot converge uh, to a Gaussian free field at the same temperature. So there is there are some recent works. So one could say, okay, but does it converge to something? Uh, and uh, I would say yes. We would expect that the integrate value Gaussian free field. So it is enough to prove that the integrate value Gaussian free field converges to a Gaussian free field at, a, at, an, at a, another temperature. Yes, to obtain, to use the same ideas used before. Yes, to obtain that the potential of the Coulomb gas is also converging to, uh, to a Gaussian free field. Uh, there, there is a recent work that goes into this direction that almost gets this result of uh, Bauer Schmidt. Park and Rodriguez. So it's just on the archive, like uh, uh, some, some weeks ago, where they show convergence of the integrated value Gaussian field in the torus and on the whole plane to that of the, uh, to, to the continuous GFF. So we are missing, let's say that this, is, this result is true also for domains to have our results. Okay, so that's that's all I can tell about the two, the potential of the Coulomb gas. It's somehow quite complete picture. What's going on with the two point function of the Coulomb gas? Well, the two point function of the Coulomb gas it is related. So here I'm missing a minus. Uh, it is related to that of the uh, Laplacian of the Gaussian free field, but this we saw it was zero times the two point correlation function of uh, the e integrate value Gaussian free field, but this if they are far apart, they are exponentially decreasing as it is a local function of the field. So you also see that this exponentially decreasing. And this is one of uh, the definitions we have of device screening. So the two point correlation function is exponentially decreasing. There is another one which has to do with the partition function when I added an non integrate charge alpha. And uh, with the small algebra, one can see that this ratio between the partition function of a Coulomb with irrational charges divided by the partition function of a Coulomb, it really behaves like, well, the interaction given by the potential of these charges with my field itself times uh, a correction given by uh, the self energy of this non integrate charges, which is this part. The modular invariance formula tells us that this is exactly the same as the, the, the Fourier transform of the difference of the integrate value Gaussian free field at zero and at point B of this Gaussian free field where I have changed the temperature. So what happens here? One, one can imagine uh, that the gradient of the, of the integrated value Gaussian free field in fact does have an infinite volume limit, doesn't matter the temperature. So when one takes n to infinity, this continues to be true. But what is essentially the difference? When we are at beta, uh, when the Gaussian free field is at really uh, low temperature, so this is low temperature for the Gaussian free field, high temperature for the Coulomb gas, then in fact, the, the infinite volume limit, it, it is uh, ergodic, yes? And uh, it, uh, the variance at each point is, is bounded. So in fact, this will converge when B goes to infinity to the expected value as exponential of two pi alpha i five zero squared. Yes? However, when beta is much bigger than one, so high temperature for the integrated value Gaussian free field, low temperature for Coulomb, this integrated value Gaussian free field, it will look close to that of a Gaussian free field. So what would expect that this one will be decreasing. So this is in zero infinity. And one would expect that this is decreasing to, sorry, zero one, uh, to us like, uh, one over uh, V for certain power alpha. So this is going to zero as V goes to infinity. 
Okay, so there is there we can also see the difference between device cleaning at high temperature, but not device cleaning at low temperature. This is of course for D equals two. Okay. So I have 10 minutes left. So here I have discussed a lot of things. So I have discussed this modular invariance formula actually immediately explained almost all device cleaning. So we are missing one device cleaning story, which is the total variation distance. So this is this is a high temperature. So I know everything at high temperature apart from this total variation distance. Everything I told you, it, the other proofs. Low temperature is harder. And what I'm missing to discuss in low temperature is how do you obtain a lower bound? What, I, what we're missing is a lower bound on fluctuations. Okay, and for to do these two things that I am missing, I need to pass to the VLAN model. And the VLAN model is a, is a, is a cousin of uh, the XY model. We could say even it's a brother of the VLAN model. So here you have a, a picture of VLAN model at low temperature. And as you can see, this, this one doesn't look close to that of an easing model at low temperature. It, that, it hasn't picked a color yet. And uh, this is uh, in fact true because of a result of Memling and Wagner. They proved that for any temperature, in fact, the two point correlation function of the uh, VLAM of the XY model, it actually is going to zero always. So this means that there is, there is no at the moment where the uh, XY model decides a, a Besides a color, coming back, just to remind you, the VLAN model was the spin system uh, with a, associated to a Dirichlet energy whose spin were on S1, yes? So I, I am the circle. So in a way, what this uh, result tells you is that you are not choosing an angle at low temperature. It's not possible to choose an angle. And the proof of this, it goes out from the following idea is uh, one can look at this object, which is an instanton in which everyone is looking to the right at the boundary. And at the center, you have, a, you have one that is looking to the left. The question is how much does it cost to the system to do this? One can compute the energy of, let's say the best object, the object which has the less energy that is doing this. And the energy of this is, of all than one over log n. So it is really small. And what this implies is that, well, the angles given by an XY model, they are really close to the angles given by an XY model changed by this instant. And that expected value at zero is close to, to expected value at zero times the one of the instanton, but this is changing signs. So this is will be minus that so they are really close which means that when n goes to infinity this expected value is going to zero this is one way of seeing uh, why there is no phase transition in um, in the xy model but this argument actually works for a lot of uh, system with with continuous spins in particular it will work for this model which is the one we need which is the vlan model so vlan model uh, in VLAN model, we do we write the, X, the energy associated to one edge of the VLAN of the XY model, and we assume that, that we are at really low temperature. So we do a so we do a Taylor expansion here. So one here one get T one minus T J theta one theta I minus theta J divided by two. However, there is a, a tricky part here. These thetas they are angles, so they live for me in minus pi pi. So imagine that you have your circle here, you are at really low temperature. However, you have one friend who's here and the other one is here. Uh, this Taylor expansion is not the good object of the cosinus. This theta i minus theta j is really big, but the cosinus is really close to one. So you have, sorry, you have one plus one minus one. Uh, how, so what do you do? What you do here is that you periodize your approximation. And the nice ways to periodize this is by the heat kernel on the circle. 
in the circle. And then you can define the VLAN model as, as a product of all the energies associated to edges. So this is the energy associated to one edge, energy of one edge. And the VLAN model is the, the Radonic coding derivative with respect to the half measure is uh, just the product over each edge of its energy. Okay. So here we have a picture of uh, a simulation of VLAN model at low and at high temperature. And one can see that there is a difference. And uh, this one really looks like a high temperature easing. However, the one on the left looks like a critical easing. And, uh, and this, in fact, was realized in the, in the physics world by Bensinski, Constance, and Taules. And it comes out, and, and they call this a phase transition, which is the topological, which they call topological phase transition by reasons we are going to see soon. And it can be seen in the following way. Well, the VLAN model at high temperature, the two point correlation function, this can be thought as the, this is the same as the cosine of theta. V1 minus theta VQ. This is decreasing exponentially fast. However, Prolick and Spencer in this famous paper I have been uh, mentioning all the way through, they show in 81 that at low temperature, in fact, the two-point correlation function is, is polynomial, is decreasing polynomially, as for the case of critical missing model. And, uh, and this polynomial, the, this epsilon beta, is related to the epsilon beta we saw for the integer value Gaussian free field. So what happens in the case of the Gaussian free field? So instead of having, if you have the angles, instead of being a minus pi pi, you have a, let's say, a, a Gaussian free field modulo two pi. In the case of the Gaussian free field, you do not have this correction epsilon beta, but everything else behaves the same. And this is, of course, for d equals two. I'm talking here, everything I'm talking here is for dimension equal to two. This is not true for dimension higher. Um, and why do they call it topological? It is because uh, it, it somehow stems out of the existence of these uh, vortices. So a vortice is a part of the field in which I'm turning either clockwise or counterclockwise. Yes, something like that. And what Bensinski, uh, Constance, and Taules, they, uh, they imagine, I mean, they, it's not imagine, but let's say, the, the, the main reason for, for there to be a phase transition is because at low temperature, they expect that these vortices, they come in pairs. Yes, so, so it costs too much energy to create one vortex. However, at high temperature, the entropy wins and the vortex, they become unbinded. So they call it binding and unbinding of the vortices. However, how do we see this as in the, in the Gaussian, in the, in the mathematical world? What are the vortices and what is their law? So we do the following. Uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. So imagine that you sample a VLAN model, and then you want to tell me, okay, so what, what is the vortex associated to this point? So here I have a something turning like this, like this, let's say like this and like this. And we would want to say, okay, there is it has been one turn and there is one vortex here, but, but it's not clear how we do it. And uh, we are going to do the following. So first fix this edge. And after we have sampled a VLAN model, we are going to do the following. We are going to start on this green edge. We are going to fix the starting point. It was in this direction. The finishing point, let's say was in was here. And we are going to, uh, draw a Brownian bridge whose length depends on beta. Uh, I will not be explicit in exactly how it depends on beta, but we are going to draw Brownian bridge in the circle. And what we are going to see is how many times it is crossing this red point in which it's changing between minus pi and pi. So it's going to be, let's say here, this will be, it gives minus one turn because it turned counterclockwise. And I'm going to do this independently in each edge. Here maybe got two, here maybe got three, and here maybe got, uh, let's say minus one also. Okay? And what I'm going to associate, and if one sees, 
one follows these green lines and one adapts these uh, values here, it will actually count how many turns this Brownian struck Brownian Brownian like object gave around this center point, which would be three. And this we will call the value of the vertex at the point three. And what we prove with this stuff is that if one does defines vortices in this way from the Villan model, in fact, the loss of the vortices is that of is, a, is that of a Coulomb gas at inverse temperature of two, two pi square and beta. Yes. So in a way, the Coulomb gas appears as the vortices of the Villan model. The, this is exact. There is a coupling what these things are going through. And what is cool is that it allows us to uh, that there to solve the two consequences we wanted. So for the bias screening, okay. So for the bias screening, what we wanted was to say that if I take one part here and one part here, the law is really close to be completely independent. How do you do this? Well, you know this is the case for Villan model, and one can prove it by uh, using uh, Glauber dynamics, for example, to obtain that the, the green part and the, the, and the pink part, they are uh, really close to being independent for the Villan model. And what we know is that the Coulomb gas can be obtained just by adding some kind of deterministic randomness to, uh, to the Villan model. So, so in a way, this implies directly that for the Coulomb gas in the the Coulomb gas on the faces of the green part is independent of the Coulomb gas on the faces of the uh, pink part. The other thing that it allows us to do is to lower bound the, uh, the potential of a Coulomb gas. So as I said before, okay, so I didn't tell before. So what I'm going to call in each edge, there is some kind of nice thing of this construction is that given that I have theta in each edge, I am independent. This, this value, this random variable, is independent, I'm going to call it M. So M is a variable that lives in edges. And if, for example, if I want to compute what is the value of the Coulomb gas here, I just have to add the value of M on all the edges that are surrounding it. Okay? So how, so how does one uh, obtain lower bounds on the variance? Or say, okay, the variance of the potential of the Coulomb gas is equal to the variance of the potential of the expected value of the variance plus of the conditional variance plus the, vari the, the variance of the conditional expected value. So this is classical uh, story that we use a lot in statistics. No? Um, which is nice is that both of these parts contribute a certain uh, variance. It contributes a certain uh, way that I'm fluctuating, but both of them are positive. So if we want to lower bound the variance, it suffices to lower bound one of them. We are going to lower bound the first one. So what is the variance? the conditional variance of a Coulomb gas density against a function, well, the Coulomb gas, I can obtain it out of these m's, these m variables. And when one rearranges the sum, what it happens is that I have the variance of a, the conditional variance of a sum. But this object here, they are conditionally independent given theta, so I can take them out of the variance. The term that appears here, in a certain way, it corresponds to the variance of a Gaussian free field. And the terms that appear here, well, they can be lower bounded in many ways. The obvious way is saying, OK, I will take the worst possible variance. This is not 0. So I will obtain this. This will give us a bound, which is not the optimal one. The, for the optimal one, one needs to be a little bit more clever. But it is possible to be done. And one obtains, essentially, what I, what I told you. I think this is a good point to, to, to stop. So I will jump three, two slides. And I would like to say gracias for listening to me and for the invitation.